Hey everyone, back again. Now, let's continue on with Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. Here we're going to be starting with part two, titled Imperialism, and the chapter in chapter five, titled The Political Emancipation of the Bourgeoisie. And before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. If you are new, go check out parts one and two and like the other... 270 or some videos I have up already or episodes I have up already. You can follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guignow. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form. Or if you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find me on YouTube where I sometimes accompany this these episodes with videos. Or, or uh, 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 if you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of it. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. If you're listening to this in a podcast platform that allows you to leave reviews or five stars, do those things. It would help me out. And yeah, so let's continue on here now with um, Hannah Arendt's discussion of imperialism. So the last two episodes discussed anti-Semitism, and this one now we're going to talk about imperialism before it leads into totalitarianism. And this part starts with a preface. So in the preface here for part two for imperialism, she stresses how colo uh, imperialism follows colonialism and is it directly attributable to political and economic factors beginning toward the end of the 19th century, specifically around 1884. Now, colonialism was that act of like going places, extracting uh, goods from those places and just conquering people essentially. Imperialism introduces more of like additional bureau bureaucratic functions in order to uh, additional bureaucratic functions in order to command people in certain places. So it means uh, an extension of a state machine of a state apparatus into new places so as to control people without, you know, outward or explicit violence. Even though this violence still existed, imperialism is not a kind um, institution, but it would try to also do so through coercive political and bureaucratic means. And imperialism is guided by a new logic of expansion for expansion's sake, you know, just about dominating as many new territories as possible without any clear political or even economic goal in mind. And at the time when this was occurring, uh, and even before it, you know, people who are even the biggest capitalist sympathizers, like Adam Smith, for example, were diametrically opposed to colonialism and the imperialism that would come after it. And that is because they aren't lucrative um, for capitalist industry. In fact, they risk spreading things too far, it's too much to manage and all that. And also, and if you can believe it, like Adam Smith, in the Wealth of Nations, which I've done a bunch of episodes on if you're curious, very explicitly says that there were just people living in these places and they, you know, their lives were ruined uh, for the sake of profit. And he's like, that you can't do that. And he's obviously guided by that, you know, John, you know, very much in the same vein as John Stuart Mill, being like, you know, you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't harm someone else. So these colonial efforts were for him not, you know, not not great. Uh, they did, they were bad, not to mention as well that slavery he was opposed to because slavery is obviously not a good way to actually run business. Uh, and, and anyways, I'm kind of getting off track here, but the point is that this new logic, expansion for expansion's sake, signals a departure from economic um, drives for expansion, where it just becomes about expanding for its own sake. Now, we saw these imperial efforts of Europe's imperial efforts start to wane and go down after World War II, but then we saw them get picked up by instead the United States, by Russia, by China, other countries that would pick up the mantle of these imperial efforts. And these new imperial formations take on another form altogether. You know, they work for ideological reasons and political ones, not necessarily for economic ones or anything like that. Um, and, you know, the reason that that's the case is that these new, new imperial efforts that demand putting up like military bases all across the earth, essentially, and setting up other kinds of connections with countries 
takes a lot of money and it is not lucrative. It doesn't, you don't get money back from setting up military bases, but it nevertheless signals that desire to expand and to have a presence everywhere on earth that the United States certainly embodies. And this means just because it's so expensive, this means that only the richest countries can actually participate in this. So they're obviously going to look after their own interests. So her focus here, though, is, of course, it's not on that. It's on European imperialism and what it did to dissolve the idea of the nation state, to really attack this idea of the nation state and to contribute to world politics and therefore to totalitarianism. So that puts us here right into the part, right into the chapter five, the political emancipation of the bourgeoisie. So she locates this period of imperialism to the late 19th century, to around 1884, between then and 1910, 1914, around that time. So the horrors that it horrors that it produced make its connection to totalitarianism very clear. Uh, imperialism and the colonialism that came before it were, are horrific examples of what uh, humans are really capable of and the harms that they can inflict on other humans. And at first, it was largely motivated by a desire to move beyond what the state could afford the richest classes. At this time, the burgeoning, the emerging bourgeoisie, they wanted to earn more dollars, even though it would be ultimately bad. They wanted to earn more money, and they didn't see many opportunities to do that in the state. So the state and the bourgeois became at odds a little bit at this point because the bourgeois economic interest was not satisfied by the state and what the state could offer in these politicians. So in this period, many European nations saw their imperial efforts increase many times over, and it was a natural development of their profit-seeking interest groups, like they very much wanted to just earn these dollars. And it's really just the nature of capitalism that it's going to expand and seek out new markets whenever it completely consumes one market. It will go somewhere, completely suck up all the resources it can, uh, the people's general well-being might uh, increase a little bit, they might ask for more wages, and then the entire apparatus will leave and go somewhere else, leaving those people who had just earned you know, a little bit of money from their situation, leaving them completely in the dust, all the while the people exploiting them are, are fine and able to just send their industry wherever they want. Now, because imperialism was so inextricably tied to the capitalist economy and the needs of uh, capitalists who were the you know big money owners of the people, because it was in their interest to uh, motivate imperialism, that then became a certain norm where the people, the general public, began to view imperialism as a necessary act in order to keep you know the richest people in their country who stood in for that country, who stood in for the wealth and power of the country, in order to keep them afloat. So it naturalized imperialism. And, you know, we hear this if you ever talk to anyone who um, has these problematic views that like, oh, well, every nation has committed some kind of colonialism. So therefore, there must be something natural to it, even though that's not true at all. Uh, not every nation has. But in any case, it's just it says less about the nature of humankind and more about the um, impact of and demands of a certain economy upon people to force them to do this kind of thing. And of course, I'm being a little bit generous by saying that they were forced, but in any case, that they felt compelled to move beyond their borders and to expand and exploit other people. Now, colonialism obviously precedes this, but what happened at this time that was particularly striking for Arendt was that Nations with very little social cohesion, and, and really at the time, a lot of turbulence in, in, uh, in terms of political social cohesion, began to expand themselves, and that lack of cohesion came with them. And so people were not you know, exactly excited about joining a new country uh, in any case of colonialism, but especially not if the nation that is arriving and colonizing is in itself uh, chaotic and doesn't actually have any kind of structure, any kind of purpose or meaning. And because it 
didn't provide an actual seductive alternative to what the colonized people were living in, it would then just force its rule onto those people through these bureaucratic institutions and through, um, you know, through the church or through any other institution to put these people under their rule. But in any case, this kind of imperialism served as uh, a kind of testing ground for the way that totalitarian rule would be exerted against uh, European people back, back in Europe. And so it's not really in the interest of the nation state, let alone, you know, what I've already mentioned about capitalist interest. It's not really in the interest of the nation state to pursue colonialism and imperialism, because then all it does is it introduces new lands, new people to manage, which just spreads the entire apparatus even more thin than it already is. And it's just also bad historically, like either the people get pissed who are colonized as, you know, they should. Uh, and they fight back, or they subordinate the people through fascism or some other kinds of control, which in itself undermines the hallmark of many of these, or the hallmarks of many of these institutions, like equality, like freedom, like democracy. You know, all of these institutions that pride themselves on that suddenly have to get rid of what they see to be identity, you know, part of their identity, like freedom, like liberty, all that. And get rid of all that to exert its control over these people, which reveals the extent to which that these institutions are not naturally uh, benevolent. You know, they can be appropriated to um, to put forward very problematic, very violent, very anti-democratic ideals. So this, pro so well, yeah, this produced a tension between uh, political figures at home and those of. The imperial, uh, the, the the imperial figures uh, in 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 other lands and other nations, and so this only exacerbated the problems inherent to political office to that society, and what this also did is just showed that you know if people are going to be um, put under a kind of rule, it's going to backfire because. You know, those people who are trying to enforce this rule don't have the support of the main nation that they're coming from. And the people being ruled obviously don't like it. So it's going to, you know, create such a bad situation that for some nations, maybe the best solution is not to actually try to impose any kind of serious ordering and to just act more discreetly in how this imperialism is conducted, to kind of sneak in and slowly implement your institutions into the into the fold while leaving the people be as like free as as possible and she gives the example of how uh, britain's colonization of india is different from that of france's colonization of algeria and without you know don't have to go into too many details about that in any case they were different approaches so ultimately imperialists want to in her words expand political power without the foundation of a of a body politic without the the necessary ingredient for a healthy political order and imperialism is paid for by superfluous money the only way you could have imperialism is if certain needs are met in a society and there is an abundance of money that can be used to suddenly send people off to do unproductive work to go and exploit people to set up institutions that don't necessarily translate into uh, monetary returns into capital. If anything, imperialism is good for trade more so than it is for uh, capitalism, more more so than for industry. Because if you wanted to, you know, exploit a people, you'd need to set up an entire industry there to uh, get people working for very cheaply, and that would cost a lot, especially at the time. You know, you'd need to. It'd be very difficult to just put up uh, warehouses and and um, factories in other places. And so the best way to actually earn any kind of money through this was through trade, was through uh, finance capital. And at the time, because more Jewish people were actually involved in that than in capitalist industry, this meant that people were going to associate the problems that came about through imperialism, not with imperialism itself, but with a few bad actors that were making the situation bad, who were capitalizing or exploiting the situation, most notably 
Jewish financiers who were just, you know, making a few dollars, not getting rich by any means, and who were mediating interactions or transactions between uh, countries. And they were seen as the ones creating all the havoc. But still, even if in the best case scenario, Jewish financiers were actually able to bring in lots of money from uh, colonized nations through imperialism, this didn't necessarily translate into public and political support for imperialism because just earning money doesn't actually guarantee someone is going to gain political power. It was only when this wealth could be associated with or, or could be shown to be a tool for more power, for more political power, that it was supported by the people and by these politicians. And it was at this point that the bourgeois started to enter into the political game. That is, they saw it as an opportunity to, you know, encourage more imperialism. If they could get their people into politics, they could begin to uh, further control the tides of imperialism. And their uh, economic power, now in conjunction with their emerging political power, allowed them to convince the public about the merits of imperialism, to convince them that it was a good system that had to be upheld and had to be continued. Now, Arendt locates this drive for, you know, bourgeois political power, locates this to, um, to the work of, of Hobbes, whose view of the world was that everyone should act according to their own will as long as it works in conjunction with the will of the entire public. So the bourgeois could say that if I succeed, you all succeed, which is a very scary narrative and one that definitely we would hear come out of like Donald Trump when he's like, he's a super rich guy, of course, is like me being rich means that you will be rich. And people saying in you know, his early rallies, uh, that like, oh, Trump is rich. He's going to make all of us rich, which is like, it's, it's not how this works. Uh, but in any case, just drawing some parallels. Now, in this situation where bourgeois rule is beginning, bourge, bourgeois rule, bourgeois, oh God, uh, bourgeois rule is taking over and it fosters a situation where it's everyone against everyone else. And the only reason anyone does anything good is if it helps them. In a situation like that, of course people are not going to be willing to just adopt or submit to any kind of codes and conventions that are you know, being put forward by the state in order to better uh, that society. People aren't just going to do that. And so it, 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 it encourages what Arendt calls a blind conformism of bourgeois society and how this has to come about through force. People have to be forced into buying the system just because of how messed up it is. They're forced to adopt it. Otherwise, they're going to be punished uh, because it, it's not in their interest. People are, certainly people are gullible, no doubt about it. But eventually they're going to see that all of these imperial efforts are actually hurting them while only benefiting a few, only benefiting those bourgeois. And this also relates to an idea, you know, also going back to Hobbes, and we'd see this in Spencer later on, and, you know, coming out of Darwin's theories that we're going to talk about as well a little later on. With this, and with the capitalist economy in generally, there is an underlying idea about the survival of the fittest. You know, if you work the hardest, you'll be fine. You know, if you you the person the person who does the best work will succeed and so on this very uh evolutionary uh approach to the economy and what this did at the time was it gave people who felt like they were outcasts who felt like they were on the margins of society justification for their hatred of those within it because they viewed those within it who were benefiting from the situation not necessarily the bourgeois but rather those people who were seen as working in secret, Jewish people, viewing them as the problem and them in need of um, combat, you know, having wanting to fight them to then realize this, these outcasts, these people on the margins of society to realize their own power so that they wouldn't feel inconsequential anymore, so that they would feel big and feel important. 
And as the system is predicated upon uh, uh, directionless expansion, it only produces more and more outcasts, more and more people who want to be part of something that they hear little murmurs of this this promise of a of a, of a social order of, of a community somewhere out there that is somehow being withheld from them not because of the nature of capitalism generally that'd be too much of a uh, a too nuanced understanding of the situation instead it's a few bad actors who are the jewish people that are the problem here and look we can point to these financiers who are getting rich off of our um our sadness our loneliness our isolation so we must go after them and this is really endemic to the capitalist economy where hannah arendt says and she is by means no marxist in any way shape or form but she says here that a political system that only cares for private property cannot possibly proceed toward anything but the final destruction of all property. That is, if it is all about everyone's own self-interest, what we will find is that people, society itself will crumble and no one will actually be able to have anything at all. We need some cooperation. And at the time, people were believing very heavily, as you know, the bourgeois wanted them to believe, that it was all about them submitting to themselves, to just live atomized, detached lives without a care in the world about anybody else but themselves. And a system predicated upon the accumulation of capital or the accumulation of power will only eventually end up devouring itself because there's only so much it can expand into. The earth is only so big, and so it will eventually have to start turning against itself which just reveals how this, you know, it's totally intractable, the system, it, it is not designed for longevity. It is not designed uh, with the future in mind. It is about the immediate satisfactions of the present, which is ultimately going to, you know, who knows what it's going to culminate into. I mean, we're, we're getting the taste of this kind of global expansion right now with what's going on in Russia and, and Ukraine. And we just, we have to be very mindful of how um, these things will go and what can be done to curb them, to try to make the future a more equitable, uh, one that is designed for longevity and for the betterment of, of as many people as humanly possible. And that seems like, uh, probably a pretty good idea, but you know, I'm obviously a bit of an idealist in that way. And anyways, let's, I don't want to, yeah. So there was so much prosperity and superfluous wealth that they sought new markets to spend it in, of course, so they wanted to expand. And capital had to be exported to mitigate crises because there was, you know, overproduction can lead to crises. That's certainly what happened in the uh, 1920s, at the end of 1920s with the financial crash in New York, in the United States. Like there was overproduction of goods to the point that people, there was no demand. So suddenly people... Uh, these industries weren't making money, people couldn't get paid, and everything just collapsed. At least that's my very reductive reading of it. In any case, that's kind of what we were confronted with. So capital had to be uh, exported, had to just be sent off in order to keep uh, the inflation rate at a very manageable pace. And so there, people saw this, yet they were like, wait, I'm poor, and we're just sending money overseas to these stupid imperial efforts or to um, you know, these stupid people just to benefit a few Jewish people who are working these financier jobs. And this just contributed to the culture of hate against um, Jewish people who were seen as being kind of parasitical. And even the bourgeois at the time, which also motivated the Bolshevik, uh, you know, Trotskyite, um, it was really, you know, after Trotsky, after Lenin, with Stalin and the Bolsheviks that we'd see that kind of uh, that kind of totalitarianism emerge, but it was largely in response to bourgeois culture and to um, the petit bourgeois culture and, and so on. The bourgeois were clever, though, in that if they did send money overseas, they could veil it as being foreign investments that would maybe one day yield returns to the people. Now, of course, that didn't happen. You know, there's all like illusions and these everyday people didn't actually reap the benefits of it, but they were still promised that they would. And so there was, you know, a superfluous working class too. what Marx calls the Industrial Reserve Army, where there are so many people uh, wanting to work with growing populations 
and industries were trying to cut back on jobs as much as possible in order to save money. So what you had is masses of people that were prepared to work but didn't have anywhere to work. So they would then fall into the fold of these imperial uh, efforts and they would be sent overseas, they'd be sent to other nations in order to work in these uh, emerging industries there, which contributed to the kind of capitalization of these different uh, countries. So it's no surprise then that these logics, that is this bourgeois capitalist logic, gave birth to the bourgeois, or gave birth, sorry, to the mob, because the mob is itself something that is directed by individual interests, but people coming together, not for community, but for hatred or for like blind passion for a goal that they see all on an individual level will benefit each of them individually. Like what we saw with the Freedom Convoy in Canada, it was about how can we uh, potentially make everything more dangerous for everyone, but let us benefit a few individuals uh, as much as we can. The few individuals that feel themselves to be under threat in this situation. And likewise, at the time, countries, nations began to take on this veneer of individuality as well, where they felt themselves to be just one individual among other individual nations, which would justify their wanting to accrue more power, you know, to realize this project of the survival of the fittest. They wanted to be the fittest nation that would stand above the rest. And that puts us here into chapter six titled Race Thinking Before Racism. And it's also happens to be a good time for an ad. Yeah, okay, I hope that wasn't too jarring. Here into chapter six, race thinking before racism. So although race thinking was popularly attributed to Nazi Germany, it has a long history uh, to way before then. And race thinking, Arendt puts on the same level as class thinking, where race thinking suggests that the history of humankind is about the clash between races, whereas class thinking attributes the history of humankind to uh, the clash between classes, between economic groups. So for those that submit to the idea of class thinking, they say the workers must assume power because they are the ones that are the most affected by other groups. Whereas in the case of race thinking that we saw, it was that white people must assume power because they have been disenfranchised by other groups like Jewish people. Now, the thing about race thinking as opposed to class thinking is that it has a scientific backing to it, even though it's just pseudoscience. Now, for all the Marxists out there who are, you know, would say that, no, you know, uh, class-based thinking is also based on science. You know, Marx was trying his best to put forward this thing called scientific socialism, and there are those elements there. What I mean here instead is that at the time when the idea of race was emerging, it became associated with certain qualities that were um, indistinguishable from the person who was raced in that way. Whereas in the case of class, you could essentially transform your class if you know a certain uh, bad luck or good fortune befell you. You know that could change. Whereas in the case of race, you didn't have that possibility to change, and so science stepped in to say, "Here are the pseudoscience," I should say. Here are the universal truths to what it means to be Jewish or what it means to be black or what it means to be white. And you must accept these as being truths because I am science and I am telling you that these are truths. Now, of course, Arendt is very clear that this wasn't real science. Instead, this was people using science to justify their messed up beliefs, their discriminatory or prejudiced beliefs, and they would twist science to fit it. So fields like biology, or physiology or anything, race thinking was the consequence of those fields, those emerging fields, rather than the causes of them. So it wasn't that people believed that there were races and then used biology to understand the difference. Biology emerged and then certain ideological figures, certain um, political figures or other powerful figures use that rhetoric of biology to justify the belief that there were superior races to others, there were and there were inferior races to other races. And so racism and the science that is used to justify it 
is a very good justification for imperialism. Because if you are able to say to, you know, convince a population that one group of people is uh, naturally subordinate, they're naturally subhuman, you can more easily justify taking their land and taking their resources and, you know, uh, assimilating them, killing them. Uh, you can justify all of these things very easily with the help of science and with the help of racism. But at the time, the nation state was really trying to embrace, you know, as best as it could. Well, maybe I shouldn't give it that much credit, but was trying to ostensibly embraced, embrace the idea of equality. So in that way, imperialism, as it is founded upon racism, uh, is anathema. It is opposed. It is the antithesis to everything that the nation state claimed that it stood for, like equality and liberty, which only further exacerbated the hatred that people had of the nation state because it was getting in the way of expanding into these new markets and exploiting these people. Now, interestingly, race thinking might actually have its roots in class thinking. And she provides the example of France, where someone by the name of uh, Boulainvilliers was, would describe the aristocracy as being a separate race from everyday people. And she traces this to be one of the first examples of discussing people in terms of like biological race, how the aristocracy are just in themselves a different species almost to everyday people. And at the time, this set the stage for a national division and civil war, of course, that would, we know how that turned out. But then later on in Germany, after the Prussian uh, army's defeat by Napoleon, the idea of race was erected to unite people against foreign domination. So this was a pretense for nationalist wars. So in the case of Boulainvilliers, who was saying that you know, the aristocracy is a different race from the lower classes, this produced a civil war. Whereas in Germany, where the idea of race was used to create distinctions between the German people and foreigners, what that produced or contributed to is the possibility of having wars between nations, now between different races that are uh, stand in for these nations. Now, these examples are just the kind of embers or the, the original points of race thinking as it would culminate into Nazi Germany. But we could see how it was it would set up the stage for a belief in a superiority of some races over others. And as we would see, like in the superiority of white Christians over uh, non-white Jewish people, you know, because they were associated with being another race or with Roma people or gay people belonging to a whole other species and so on. Now, in terms of the actual discussion of race, as we might be more familiar with it today, we see this really come about uh, in the mid-19th century in France as well with the work of um, Althel de Gobineau, or Arthur de Gobineau, <laughs> Althel de Gobineau, who, was, uh, who wrote the, um, the text that's titled Essai sur l'inégalité uh, des races humaines. Sorry, I, my, my uh, writing was kind of messed up there. So, which is titled like On on Human Races or Essay on the Inequality of Human Races. Essay sur l'inégalité des races humaines. So, what, what that is to say is that at that time, this text was released and this sought to create distinctions between people on the basis of their race. Now, he also submitted to the idea that nations and Western civilization were under threat and he attributed this to what he called the degeneration of race and the decay of race is due to a mixture of blood. So there was, he believed that there was a pureness associated with race, specifically the white race, and how that pureness, which is wrapped up with an idea about a pure state, the pure nation state, is going to crumble if there is a mixture of blood, if there's interracial marriages or marriages, you know, between, between black people and white people and Jewish people and uh, non-Jewish people and so on. So he believed very firmly that race was the most important thing and people had to be uh, belong to their own race. And this is all setting the stage for the idea about the Aryan species, you know, the pure blood species who uh, were essentially a race of princes who wouldn't have mixed blood. 
And it wasn't just France or Germany here either. Britain participated in this and all of these other nations at the time when their kind of scientific uh, revolution was happening at the time through the Enlightenment began to find new justifications for ostensibly archaic ideas like racism, like prejudice. Suddenly these new institutions that in themselves aren't necessarily going to contribute to this. Science is not naturally going to uh, confirm or, uh, or deny racist beliefs, but it is a very convenient way to justify racist beliefs. So you'd have things that like, uh, like the size of somebody's skull is going to determine whether or not they're smart or, or, or not. And so you'd have British people running all over Europe, like um, measuring different uh, people from different African nations, like in the case of Rwanda, measuring their skulls and then separating them on the basis of the size of their skulls or the shape of their heads, which of course creates artificial distinctions that can become true or can become real and can have real effects in the world even though it is based off of nothing. I mean, it can culminate into eugenics and into genocide, which is why we have to be very careful. People need to be very careful in how they utilize um, science that obviously has a very exalted status in the world, use it to put forward certain narratives. And in England as well, we saw uh, there was a lot of use of Darwinism to promote um, racism this idea of the survival of the fittest, fittest, which actually comes from Herbert Spencer, I believe. But in any case, Darwin's ideas did lend credence to the idea that some people were just superior to others. Or like in the case of evolution that traces, uh, that says that there's like a, a direct line between uh, the earliest humans and people today as though it's just a kind of linear sequence. That means therefore that people who resemble these earlier people are there, uh, therefore underdeveloped. So if in the textbooks, these earlier people, people are uh, illustrated as being black or brown, then white people in this context are going to associate black or brown people with uh, a kind of primitiveness and associate them with being inferior to white people. And then you'd see some like, and in the case of uh, Benjamin Disraeli from one of the last episodes, where he discusses he used this logic to justify the colonization of India that would be used. Um, essentially, his narrative was that Indian people are less developed than European people or people in Britain. And so therefore, it is almost their duty to go in and spread the word of parliament, to spread the word of British society to these people, which is, you know, it's obviously founded upon nothing, yet it has very consequential effects in the world and in, in all of these people's lives. And yeah, that puts us here into chapter seven titled Race and Bureaucracy and where I'll actually end this episode off. So if you listen this far, uh, I really applaud you, but please keep going. It, it's important to get all of these parts in before we can fully understand the formation of totalitarianism uh, at the end of the book. So if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it uh, or anything I omitted. I'd love to hear about it if you're willing to put in the time. Um, and yeah, take care.